Hi, everybody. This is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Welcome to Beatles News Brief. I'm freelance journalist Steve Marinucci. Today we have a special Beatles News Brief Extra with an exclusive interview with author Eric Colonius, who, as you'll hear, had a great encounter with John Lennon. Following the interview, we'll have some news for you. I'm here with Eric Colonius. Is that is, I, do I have the correct pronunciation of your name, Eric? It's absolutely perfect. Okay, yes. okay. And he took a, a photograph of John Lennon that is um, that I'm going to write about, uh, and it will be uh, if it isn't already, it'll be on my blog, and it'll also be on my um, Beatles news group. But I wanted to talk to Eric about the the shooting of the picture and. And about his his work. First of all, you are, you are a journalist, correct? That according to what yeah. the information, what uh, who have you worked with? Yes, exactly. I'm a I'm a, uh, a writer, and I worked for some. I actually started a paper called the Boston Phoenix, or helped start it in 1970. I haven't seen a lot of issues, but I know I had seen a, you know at least a couple. Um, yeah, well, it unfortunately it lasted until about two years ago. Uh, and they finally pulled the plug, but it, it won a, cu- a couple of Pulitzer Prizes. And you know, when I was there, um, the um, um, John Landau, who's been Springsteen's manager for a long time, was the music editor. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, and he was you know just starting out, and he introduced me to Livingston Taylor and James Taylor. Oh my gosh! Um, yeah, and. Um, Two guys came and wanted me to uh, write a, a newspaper for them, a little newspaper, and I was so I could do that. I did that on the side. It was about the Bahia religion. They, they brought me back to their apartment, played some tapes for me, and um, I went to see one of their shows. And I was just about the only person there, but but that was Seals and Cross, and uh, hmm. you know. And then um, the photographer um, for the Phoenix was dating Bonnie Raitt. Oh and my I got gosh. to know her too. So oh it was gosh. an interesting, interesting, you know, seminal point. And uh, it was in Boston in 1970, and you know <laughs> everything was happening there. So it was pretty neat. You co-found, yeah. co-founded the the Phoenix. Yeah, I was one of about. Oh, I'd say there were about eight of us, you know. Mm-hmm. And actually, we put the first uh, edition together at MIT. We were in the in the. Uh, I was directing the student publications, and I was all 20 years old, Mm -hmm. and we were up, you know, on Mass Ave up there, and uh, that's where we first put the the issue together, and uh, it was just, you know, what a way to start your life, you know. Wow. yeah, that, a year earlier, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life, and all of a sudden, I was doing that, and uh, and then I, and then you know, I ended up going to Columbia after that, um, the journalism school, and then sort of knocked around, you know, writing small newspapers and trying to, you know, learn my craft, and and uh, eventually got to the Wall Street Journal and did really well there, and they sent me overseas, and then back as an editor in New York, <clears throat> right beneath the World Trade Center, and. Uh, my. And then I went to Newsweek in Miami and did that for about five or six years and then went to Fortune and then sort of got into, you know, writing books with people and things like that. So what books, I've been doing this. What books have you done? <laughs> well, I, I just had a lot of books I collaborated on, but I um, I did one that was a, um, a big book in 2008 called Predictably Irrational. I, I did that with a – it was sort of the um, sequel to um, Freakonomics. I did that with a with a guy from MIT. Okay, okay. You know, and I wrote a book about the last slave ship to come to America, and I'm halfway through a book about Miami. So I keep writing, you know. And uh, I, I know, I know that feeling. Yes, we we, we all do. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So how? So you? This is. Let's go to the the photographs. This is 1972. Okay. 1972. Who were you? Yeah. Who who were you with at the time? What were you? Where you were in New York? Yeah, I, w- I was at Columbia, so I was in their journalism school. Okay, and, and uh, you know they just sent me. I I think they you know as I recall they just handed out assignments. Mine was to uh, go down to the courthouse, cover this trial for a few days, and so that's what I did. You know, it wasn't. Um, so I was. It, it's not a whole lot of story, but I I. Uh, um, you know, was was in there, and and people were sort of coming through, and 
I think I was there one day. I was one there one day. There was hardly anyone in there. And then the next day, I was quite a few more people. And uh, I was sort of up near the front. And uh, I looked behind me, and there was uh, Lennon and Yoko Ono and Abby Hoffman. And I had met Abby Hoffman um, previously through a girlfriend that I had. And so, you know, he remembered me, and we talked for a few minutes. I talked with Lennon and all, and uh, about the trial. And uh, and then I went out at one point, um, and they, you know, they recessed the trial while I was out in the hallway, and I had my little M3 Leica, um, which is, you know, just a tiny little quiet camera. And uh, I was standing there, and he just, he came out, and... Uh, with this sort of very somber look, and I just sent the picture, and uh, and then when I went back to Columbia, well, when I was walking back to Columbia, I was thinking, geez, I just met one of the Beatles. That's really something. But he didn't look so much like a Beatle at that point. You know, his hair was, you know, shorter, and he and and we were all talking about the trial. So and, and that's the first thing I noticed in the picture is how short his hair is. It's yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. He he looks almost like a business a businessman. Uh, I know, and and uh, you almost would have thought that it was his trial that he was there yeah. for, not somebody else's, which is yeah. really kind of it, which is really kind of interesting. Well, and that's what I, I I thought. What struck me about the photograph, um, and uh, you know, I have it on my mantle. And a number of people wanted it, and I, I've um, you know gotten a print for them. But is that you know New York was in such bad condition, and I think the world was too. Uh, we've I think people today forget that, uh, you know, with the crime, there were 27,000, there was a backlog of 27,000 felony cases in New York. And, um, you know, Central Park was just completely, you couldn't walk into Central Park without getting killed. Um, behind the public library, it was called Needle Park because there was so, many, so much drugs going on. You know, Washington Square was completely... Um, off limits because the drug situation and crime situation was so bad and the subways um, you know and I, I did I don't know if you clicked on that little that little um, um, line there that gets you into a story about the subway photographs I did later a year later mm -hmm. but the subways you know were filled with graffiti and um, and and there was the crime was just terrible um, so and then the whole world, you know, that we had we had the Black Panthers, we had bombs going off in in Congress, um, we had time bombs, you know, bank deposits, um, and then in England itself, they had the war between you know the Protestants and the Catholics, mm -hmm. and bombs exploding. So it was really, I think, a tough time uh, for everybody. And I think the Beatles, you know, it didn't occur to me until I was writing this that the Beatles, each in their own way, you know, uh, George and Paul. And John responded with these interesting um, songs and and albums that reflected those times to some extent. Mm -hmm. You said you talked to um, Lennon in the yeah. in the court uh, in the in the courtroom. Yeah. Did, how, yeah. What kind of a conversation did you guys have? Uh, you know, we talked. To, I mean, the strange thing is that we talked about the trial, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's not. You know, here's another thing, too. You know, when I went back to try to find the date of this trial, I went into the New York Times Index for 1971, and the listing under John Lennon is about a half an inch long. Mm -hmm. I, it would sort of indicate, and then if you go to 72, it's longer, but it's all about the attempt to, um, you know, to, his visa had expired and to, what do you call it, uh, ex when you move somebody out of the country, whatever that is. Uh, right. Yeah, uh, you know. uh, deport him. They tried to deport him, De yeah. Deport him, yeah. So in 71, they just had two lines in, uh, about, about Lennon, and, uh, you know, or three line, lines about him. And then they in 72, they only had something about deporting him, but nothing else. And I think it sort of indicated that, at least in my eyes, uh, you know, the Beatles were sort of over in 71, in in many senses, you know, there was a whole new world of music, mm -hmm. and they had broken up, and none of these other efforts really, you know, Wings was just getting started, and Imagine uh, was, uh, you know, had just been, um, just released about three months before I, before I met him, 
mm-hmm. and it, it didn't get great reviews from a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that they were um, they were icon they were no longer icons. Well, they they didn't have the spotlight that they did as the group. There's no there's no question. Yeah. About that. There, there's no I don't think anybody there. thought they would survive another generation. You know, people would just simply think of them as Bing Crosby or whatever. Mm-hmm. And and so I think meeting John Lennon was not as was sort of an odd situation. But I think when I went back to Columbia, I don't think I even mentioned it to anybody. Really? Did did uh, yeah. did uh, were the crowds? I mean, obviously there were people outside besides you. Um, did anybody not notice many. him? Did, not did, many. Did a lot of people notice him? Did people go up to him? Not, not really. You know, again, I, he was behind me, but I think, um, you know, the trial, first of all, was the focal point of why everyone was there. Right. And um, No, but I you, just think you, he was... you took his picture outside the courtroom, correct? Or was yeah, that... yeah, right. Oh. Right, when he came came back out. and um, But I, you know, there wasn't, I was the only person there, um, mm-hmm. you know, and he did talk to a New York Times. There was a New York Times reporter covering the trial. Okay. And I have the quote that he gave to the New York I can send it to you, that, that he gave to the New York Times guy. But it was just, you know, he just basically said, you know, I was drawn to this because of the racial overtones um, in this trial. And, um, uh, you know, and he said, I didn't really, you know, something that I didn't really understand the problems that race raises until I married a Japanese woman. You also said you knew you knew Abby Hoffman. How did he, uh, how did you find him? Well, he, his my girlfriend was uh, uh, babysat for him. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and again, I can't my memory is a long time ago, but I don't. At some point, we crossed paths enough to the point that he he recognized me. Mm-hmm. Was he? I mean, was he a a, a normal guy outside of uh, you know outside of uh, being a being the radical he was. I mean, was he a? Yeah, I mean, again, I was just a short exposure, but that I've had to, had to him. But he he seemed you know pretty nice. You know, he's a very deep thinker, and mm-hmm. um, I mean, if I had wanted to just walk out of there with with Lennon and Yoko Ono and all of them, just go out and eat, get something to eat, I could have just said, "Could I come with you?" And, we would have gone. Wow! You know, did yeah. You, did I mean, you, it was. Did you talk to Yoko at all? No. Oh, okay. Did she? She didn't. She didn't say anything in the middle of your conversation or anything like that. I think she was pretty quiet. You know, really? it was just the three of us. We were just sort of. You know, I just turned around and we and um, we might have been standing up at that point. But the judge may not have been in there. I can't remember. But I just remember we. You know, we talked. We talked about the trial, so I thought, gee, you know, I just met one of the Beatles and didn't say anything about music. Um, we talked about this trial, hmm. and uh, you know, and then I, you know, so went back to Columbia and, and then developed the picture and then put it away. And didn't, you only and you only pick. took you only took the one picture. Yeah, you know what? I might have taken a second one. I'm not sure, but um, I think it was just the one as he was walking through. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Wow, did you have have you had any any um, ha- I mean have you seen I've you never saw him in concert you never saw him perform. Well, no, I actually saw the Beatles play at Chase Stadium. Did My you? My father took me there. Yeah, yeah. What do you remember about someplace. that? What do you remember about that? Well, you know, it was. Um, first of all, I was surprised that my father would even want to go see the Beatles because he was a big classical music person mm-hmm. but we went there you know and i i think all of this you, you never it never dawned on, on us or me that there were going to be any permanence in this it was just, they were sort of a really great pop group that really uh, you know hooked me like they it hooked everybody else and uh you know i think the tickets were five dollars each <laughs> uh could you, and, could uh, you hear them yeah, well, we got in there, and after a while, you know, they came running out and all. I remember that, and uh, the uh, got up there, and they started playing, and you really couldn't hear them too well. Mm-hmm. And and by the end of it, it was sort of more interesting to watch people trying to trying to get to the stage, and all these New York policemen chasing them and tackling people. Was that? You and said, then you said that was sixty five or sixty six. Uh, because they played both years. 
Did they really? Mm-hmm. It probably was 65. Okay. It's probably 65. Yeah. And, uh, they were taken away in, a, in an armored car. Mm-hmm. I don't know if, you know, um, and, uh, and then, you know, we never, I never had, a, I never took any pictures <laughs> and, then um, never kept the tickets. Oh. And, you know, it was just one of those situations where you, uh, you didn't think about it. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, and uh, they, you know, the, the Beatles have become such a big part of my life. I, you know, in fact, I play in a couple of bands just for amusement and, you know, we play Beatles songs, you know, I can play bass along with anything that, that Paul they- McCartney play bass on <laughs> have you seen uh yeah. any have you seen any of the beatles in the years since uh in yeah, concert I saw, yeah i saw paul uh twice saw him in boston at, at, at the fenway which was just a great concert mm-hmm. that was probably um what six or seven years ago maybe mm-hmm. a little more than that and then saw him more recently in jacksonville huh. and um how about ringo um, no I, I i need to do that Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you seen Ringo? Oh, several times. Oh, yeah, I have. Have you? So y- sure. you were a music ju- journalist, is that correct? Well, I wasn't a music journalist. No, I, I um, you know, I mean, I helped start the Boston Phoenix, and um, but I, on the side, I wrote a few pieces, and some of them that went into the Phoenix. Uh, I did a uh, Gordon Lightfoot, I did, and um, and then Tim Harden. You know, it was, it was so incredible to look down on his guitar and he had, you know, he had his songs there. If I were a carpenter and, mm. and reason to believe, you oh, know, wow. and he was a, a very depressed guy and his band didn't want to have anything to do with him. And, and, you know, he was shooting drugs and all. And he said, I remember him saying to me, well, wh- you know, how hard is it to write a song? These songs are no good. And he started playing If I Were a Carpenter <laughs> for me. And it's amazing. And then Jim Croce, who was such a great guy, I saw number of his shows and the thing that that was exceptional about jim was that he was such a great storyteller and he'd he'd sit up there um with a big cigar and he'd tell um you know jokes and tell stories and then sing the songs but at one point i i asked him uh, i said well where did you go to school and uh, he said uh villanova you know university and then i saw this sort of twinkle in his eye and uh he said, um, he's, he said, yeah, I was, I was an English major. Um, I, uh, oh no, I said to him, what did you major in? And he said, English. And then he, he smiled and he said, I came out of college perfectly, uh, prepared for life in the 12th century. <laughs> and that you, is so funny. Yeah. Did you, were you also, you weren't living in Boston in the sixties, uh, during the, there, during the Beatles days, uh, during Beatlemania, right? Is that right? No, no, I was on Long Island. Oh, okay. Yeah. What was Beatlemania like for you? Uh, WABC? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was Murray the K, mm-hmm. because we were in New York and all. And, uh, you know, I mean, just like everybody else, I, I think I was in eighth or ninth grade. And, and as soon as you heard, I want to hold your hand, you know, you just, what is that? Yeah. And uh, it was just so phenomenal. And, and uh, I think there's, you know... It was great now, and my, what's terrific is my father took me to the Beatles, you know, when I was in ninth grade, mm-hmm. tenth grade, I think it was. And so with my son, um, the first big concert I took him to was Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney, cool. Uh, up at the Fenway. Wow. You know, just, so yeah, I, rem- it, I remember, I was in the New York area um, in in 66, I don't think I, it was 65, mm. but I do remember I, I was listening to WABC one night and they were playing, oh, yeah. and they were playing, um, I can't remember what song it was. Um, but anyway, they broke in the middle of the song and Cousin Brucey goes, we're live from the Warwick Hotel with the Beatles. Uh, oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. And I just happened to be running my reel to reel at the time. <laughs> Which was which was really kind of cool, but anyway. Um, uh, but yeah. Eric, Eric, you know what? Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, go ahead. No, because they, when I worked at Newsweek, you know, they were on Madison Avenue, and so I, I would always, when I had to go up there for meetings and all, I always stay at the Warwick. Oh my, really? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just so I could sort of feel the vibes. Mm-hmm. I will tell you one great, one good story that sure. relates to the Beatles. I don't think it's ever been told. 
I did a, I, uh, for Fortune magazine, I, I went out at one point and interviewed um, one of the guys who was um, the, one of the crickets, you know, oh, yeah. Buddy Holly and the crickets. Mm-hmm. And I interviewed the drummer. And he was telling me about how, um, you know, he and, and Buddy in Texas, they used to go, Buddy had a convertible. And they would go up into the hills, and if they got up there and the atmosphere was right, they could get a radio station from New Orleans. Hmm. And here they were playing this rock rockabilly stuff. And from New Orleans, there was a hotel, and there was a black rhythm and blues group that that would be broadcast called the Spiders. Mm-hmm. So any so anyhow, when they were trying to think of a name for their group, they said, "Well, why don't you know? Let's do an insect." And so they, you know, they went, they were going through a dictionary or whatever, and they came to Beatles. They said, nah, and they went to crickets. Hmm. And what I, what I think is so funny is that, you know, the, the Paul McCartney has said that part of the reason that they liked to be, to name themselves the Beatles was because of Buddy Holly and the crickets. So when I put the uh, photo up, do you want me to put a, yeah. a watermark on it or something or, or so that, well, it's got, it's, it's got a little thing on it, but you know, really what I want, people will do is just pass it along and just get it out there because um i just you know want other people to see it and uh so i encourage them to pass it along to their friends i'm sure i'm i know that will happen that will definitely happen Good. because the way that's the way that's the way beetle pictures get passed around i mean they they get passed around very quickly very quickly Good. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the okay. opportunity to talk to you and uh, take care and best of luck. Okay, thanks All right. a lot. And now a quick bit of news. People don't think that much about it lately, but at one time Ringo Starr was a serious alcoholic and so was Joe Walsh, who's now his brother-in-law. Ringo and Joe Walsh talked about how they broke away from alcohol addiction in a very illuminating interview in the current Rolling Stone written by Sarah Grant. Ringo started the interview with humor, but then he got serious. When asked before he got sober, did he fear that choosing sobriety would end his artistic life? He said, I was afraid at the beginning. I thought, I don't know how you do anything if you're not drunk. That's where I ended up. I couldn't play sober, but I also couldn't play as a drunk. So when I did end up in this rehab, it was like a light went on and said, you're a musician. You play good. Later on in the in the interview, he said, I think in my case the blessing was I was in a band, and we each had each other. Yeah, after a couple of months, one of us would be going off the rails, whether someone was having to drag me back or drag George back or John. And then near the end of the interview, he said, The discussion is very difficult because we did as much as anybody did, and we're still here and we're sober, and there's no telling when that day is when you leave. But I know in the bands I hang out with, there's a pretty, not absolutely, but a pretty large sober mentality going on now. Anyway, this is a great article, and we really, really recommend you read it. From the latest Billboard charts, dated March 16th on the Billboard 200, Beatles Abbey Road is 156, down from 153 last week, and Beatles 1 is 173, down from 160. On catalog albums, Abbey Road is number 40, uh, staying the same. Uh, on the Artist 100, the Beatles are number 81, down from number 76. On the Vinyl 25, the Beatles are num- uh, Abbey Road is number 13, down from 9. And Claypool Lennon's Delirium's uh, South of Reality is at number 19, down from number 2. From the official charts in the UK, dated March 15th, On the top 100 albums, Beatles 1 is number 94, down from 92. On the vinyl 40, Sgt. Pepper has re-entered the chart at number 29. We don't have a whole lot of details yet, but we can confirm that Ringo is back in the studio and definitely working on a new album. That was confirmed for us today by his representative. There's no word on when the album will come out. Bruce Sugar, Ringo's recording engineer, had provided the first clue of this when last week he posted a picture of himself, Steve Lukather, and Ringo in the studio with Ringo giving the peace sign. Again, we don't know when the album will be released, but we'll let you know when we find out. Ringo recently put up postings on Facebook about a new Peace and Love turntable that will soon be available through his store 
that will have his artwork on it. And here's it's a, something a, a little different. An album released at the end of January that's probably gone under your radar is named Animal Requiem by Rachel Fuller. The reason you should know about it, according to Richard Stevens, who wrote to us about it, is that the last track, track 10, is uh, Bluebird. And this is, he says, this is the exact same track on the Beatles' White Album, only with ro the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra backing McCartney. Paul donated the track to be included on this release with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra backing him. The remainder of the tracks, 1 through 9, are by the orchestra. It is a really nice version, and it makes it seem like a different version, but it's the same track. It credits Paul McCartney on the front of the booklet, but it, it is the Beatles' version. He says, Any, anyway, I just wanted anyone who is nuts as I am to know about it. Thank you, Richard. You can find a link for the album on our That's What I Want Beatles store page on Facebook, and it's also in our Beatles News and Information group, um, also on Facebook. That's it for now. You can catch our shows on fab4radio.com. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Beatles Arama. Thank you, Pat. And on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please be sure to join our Beatles News and Information group on Facebook for the latest in the Beatles world. And check out our That's What I Want Beatles store page also on Facebook for gift ideas for yourself or for your favorite people. And where you can also find links for both uh, Candy Leonard's Beatleness. Candy Leonard is the contributing editor for Beatle News Briefs and my Meet a Monkey Davy Jones ebook. Anyway, we also invite you to uh, join our Beatles Toppermost to the Poppermost message board at abbeyroad.proboards.com. Uh, anyway, enough for the commercials. We'll be looking for you next time. Please subscribe and please. Write to us and let us know what you like and what you don't like. And who knows, we may listen to you and we may even read what you write on the show. Till next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying... Be seeing you! that one market fab <laughs>